Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this talk. Um, we are going to present TocOS, which is um, an embedded operating system fully written in Rust. Uh, first of all, a few words about us. We are Alex and Alex, myself, Alexander Radovich. I'm an assistant professor at the Polytechnic University in Bucharest. My uh, field of expertise is in operating systems and compilers. Uh, I'm here together with Alex, my student. Um, he's, he's just graduated today with his bachelor's degree in engineering, and his project was presenting his contributions to TalkQuest just this morning. Uh, I'm sorry if we have if we're making a bit of mistakes or something is not clear. It's 12 a.m. in Romania, so it was a long day for us. Okay, so um, about half a year ago, uh, I was searching for interesting projects that were written in Rust uh, because of my interest in operating systems and system programming, and I stumbled upon TocOS. Uh, TocOS is a new embedded operating system which runs um, several applications concurrently on low power and low memory microcontrollers. Um, this is somehow very interesting because it borrows more or less the architecture of Linux, but uh, applied to microcontrollers. Uh, I'm not the creator, I'm not uh, affiliated to TalkOS, I just love the project and we, me and my team contributed to it for the last uh, six months. Uh, okay, so a few facts about TalkOS. It's a preemptive operating system. It was designed for Cortex-M's, MCUs, and then it has been ported to RISC-V because it's really a growing architecture and as we saw in the keynote, more and more um, institutions are using RISC-V. What makes it really different from other embedded operating systems that uh, I have worked with, it uses memory protection out of the box. So if your MCU knows or has a memory protection unit, your applications will have to obey uh, it by default. Uh, in the other operating systems that I've worked with, this was an extra step that had to be taken. Uh, it borrows a lot from the architecture of general operating systems. Uh, the kernel is fully written in Rust and is com compiled completely separate from the user space. Um, and applications are compiled separately, so you don't need the kernel to compile an app. Uh, applications could be written in any language, like C or Rust or anything that could compile uh, to a binary and anything that supports uh, position-independent code. Um, before we dive in into TalkOS components, um, I want to talk to you about a little bit about Rust. Rust is a systems programming language designed by Mozilla. Its main purpose is to offer memory safety uh, without the penalty of having a garbage collector. And Rust uses the borrow checker at compile time for this and ownership. So basically, programmers have to obey a lot of rules uh, at compilation time. Um, imagine like it's like having a language like Java or .NET, but without the overhead of a garbage collection or of a runtime. Um, due to the fact that it was designed as a systems programming language, um, from time to time when you're writing uh, operating systems, you have to access direct memory addresses or you have to directly do some pointer arithmetics or uh, you need to do some unsafe typecasts. These are generally forbidden in Rust except that Rust provides a keyword which is called unsafe, and inside this unsafe block, uh, the compiler will not check memory safety. So you as a programmer are allowed to do whatever you want. So it's like programming in C and C++ inside of Rust. Uh, having said this, um, the TalkOS kernel is completely written in Rust. It's made out of two components, the lower part, which is the hardware abstraction layer. This is where you write, um, platform dependent codes and small drivers that interact with the hardware. This part of the kernel does have some unsafe code because it's not possible to write it otherwise. On the top, of, on the top part of the kernel, we have the capsules. These are the drivers. It's just a different name for drivers. Uh, these drivers are completely hardware independent, so um, they should work on any microcontroller. They are not allowed to use the unsafe keyword, so the compiler will not compile the capsule and not compile the kernel if inside the capsule you have an unsafe keyword. Uh, they still reside inside the kernel and they talk to the lower part of the kernel through the hardware interface layer. On top of the kernel, we have the applications. These are written in any programming language. 
and they talk to the kernel using the system calls uh, and interface with the capsules like that. A better illustration of what I said is this picture, which is uh, from TalkOS's GitHub. On the lower part, we have the hardware, the microcontroller with all the peripherals. The orange part are the drivers that are specific to each architecture. So interfacing the SPI, the I2C, the timers, which are completely specific to any microcontrollers. This part has untrust, uh, unsafe code. Um, the TalkOS team has done great efforts to minimize the number of unsafe lines that are written here, but there's no other way to do it. Uh, on top of this, you have the kernel, the actual kernel, which handles memory allocation, uh, scheduling, and provides a hardware interface layer. This still has some unsafe code. And on the upper side of the kernel, you have the capsules, which interact with each other, provide an API towards the application, and use the lower capsules through the hardware interface layer. These capsules cannot use unsafe code. So they are guaranteed that compile time that capsules cannot write into each other's memory and cannot influence each other in a way that it shouldn't be desired. Um, yes, the TopOS kernel still has some unsafe code, which is like writing code in C, but compared to other embedded operating systems uh, where you have tens of thousands of lines of kind of unsafe code, in TopOS you have a small number of lines that have to be audited manually. On top of the kernel, in this example, you can see a C application, a Rust application, a service, which could be written in any language, and an application that tries to bring down the kernel by doing some infinite loop. But because of Rust, uh, of TopOS's protection, this is really difficult for an application. So why did I start, why did we start contributing to the project and why did we find it really interesting? Uh, well, these are the three things. Uh, first of all, um, it's the first uh, embedded operating system that I see that is completely asynchronous. So while applications can be preempted, the kernel cannot be preempted. So a driver cannot make a, an infinite loop or a driver cannot use a delay function. So if, ne if it needs to wait for a peripheral, it needs to issue an action to the peripheral, uh, give up the, uh, the processor for an application. And whenever the peripheral finishes, it will signal the capsule via an interrupt and the capsule can continue. Um, this is like um, a comparison would be TopOS is for embedded operating systems, like what Node.js is for programming languages. So it's completely asynchronous. In Linux, the equivalent in user space would be the async IO. Another interesting fact is that heap is not available to the kernel. So all the buffers that are available in the kernel have to be known at compile time. And this this gives us a lot of security because um, the kernel cannot overflow memory because all the memory space is known before. But um, it does create a problem when writing drivers because some drivers really need to allocate some memory to store information about applications. Um, this is handled through grants. Uh, and I'll talk about grants a little bit later. Uh, TalkOS is rather new. Uh, they started in 2014. Uh, boards that are supported in TalkOS are divided in three categories, the stable category, and these boards are fully supported, all the peripherals work. So if you just want to build some applications on TalkOS, I would strongly recommend using these boards. The second category is developmental boards. These boards are uh, partially work, uh, but there are still some peripherals and some functions that are not available. This is where I had a contribution by submitting the STM discovery boards and Alex submitted the IMX, uh, IMX RT board. Um, if you want to develop TalkOS and play a little bit with the kernel, uh, these are the boards that I would recommend as well. And there is also experimental boards, mostly RISC-V architecture because it's rather new in TalkOS. Um, these boards work, but do expect some failures or some memory uh, problems or some running problems with these boards. Um, okay, uh, TalkOS has been getting some momentum and people are starting to look at it. Um, Google has decided to use TalkOS for OpenSK. OpenSK is a project from Google where you could build a USB stick for digital signatures. Um, and there's a great effort from the TalkOS developers to port TalkOS and fully support OpenTitan. OpenTitan is a project that wants to provide an open source uh, 
silicon root of trust for um, signature and encryption chips that you will find in the new appliances and computers. It's a consortium of several companies and um, I really think TocOS is a really good uh, option for it. So a little bit about applications. Um, as I said, applications are compiled out of tree, so you don't need the kernel of TocOS to compile an application. They compile to a standalone binary. It's not an ELF file, and we'll see that further on. If the microcontroller does have a memory protection unit, the application will have to obey it. So whenever the kernel switches to an application, it will program the, the memory protection unit uh, so that the application can access only its memory. Uh, and this is really good, as I remember porting a JavaScript uh, engine last year for FreeR TOS, and uh, JavaScript is a little bit memory hungry, and we had a lot of stack overflows or um, memory overflows, and the, the result was really unpredictable. It was really hard for us to debug and see uh, what went wrong. Um, Tokus application do fault, so uh, like Linux application that segment, segment seg fault, sorry, these application fault, so if they try to write outside their memory, uh, the MPU will stop them and you will get a really nice log with the fault and we'll see how it looks like further on. It has downside, uh, applications need to have relocatable code, so the compiler needs to be able to do a position independent code. And this has been a challenge mostly for RISC-V architecture. And the thing that they somehow borrowed from Android, it seems like it, they borrowed it from Android, um, applications can expose services and other applications can browse for those services and consume those services. And this is the model of inter-process communication that TalkOS provides. Uh, if we look at the memory layout, you might notice that it's a little bit strange. Um, probably you are used to see the stack on the top, at the top of the memory. In case of TalkOS, the application code is, resides inside the flash. The stack is at the bottom part of the memory, so every application will has to specify upfront how much stack it wants to use. Uh, this is a decision made because uh, to prevent application from stack overflowing. So if they overflow the stack, what happens? The application will basically uh, overflow the memory boundary and the MPU will stop the application and you will get a nice report that the application did some um, fault. If the, app, if the stack were at the top of the memory, it would just override your heap and that would lead to uh, undefined behavior. On top of the stack, we have the data, then we have the heap, and at the top of the memory of an application, we have the grant. So as I said, the kernel is not able to dynamically allocate memory. So every capsule that needs to keep some information on a per application basis needs to declare upfront how much memory it needs to use for every application. This amount is the same. It doesn't matter what kind of application you run. Uh, on the technical side, uh, they have to declare some structures in Rust. Uh, when an application is loaded, the kernel will sum up all the requirements from the capsules and add that memory space to the application memory. If the memory cannot be allocated, the application won't start. Um, so it's either, it's a, like a transactional thing. So either the application starts and then there is enough memory for the kernel and the application to run. Either the application doesn't start because the kernel cannot allocate enough memory for its drivers. Um, another interesting fact is that um, TopOS re uses real system calls. So in many embedded operating systems, system calls are just the function calls. In this case, the uh, TOCOS uses the supervisor call instruction on ARM and the equivalent on RISC-V. It exposes five system calls, out of which uh, yield is the only one that is a blocking system calls. Um, so every process in TOCOS has uh, an event loop, uh, basically a callback queue. So when a capsule needs to inform an application about an action, it will schedule a callback. Callbacks are not called while the application is running. Whenever the application uh, calls the system called yield, um, the TopOS kernel will verify the queue. If there is a callback function in the queue, it will call the callback function and then resume the application from the system call. This is very similar to a generator in Python. Um, when your main function exits in the application, the C library will simply yield continuously. This is the only system call that can block an application. 
Subscribe. Subscribe allows an application to register a callback. It gets the capsule number. This is the ID of the driver. And the Tokers kernel will redirect this subscribe call to the specified capsule and the, call, and the pointer to a callback function and the user data. The command um, system call is similar to IOCTL from Linux. It will ask uh, the a driver, a specific driver, to perform an action. The difference being that the result of the system call is not the result of the action. It's just an acknowledgment that the action will be performed. Uh, allow uh, provides a mechanism for applications to share a buffer with the driver. For instance, if you have a capsule that um, wants to read something from the flash or from the network, uh, you will share a buffer with the driver. The driver will fill the buffer and then call you back that the buffer is filled. The last one is memory operation. This is targeted to the kernel. It's similar to BRK or SPRK from Linux. Uh, it does memory management, so it uh, hires the heap or lowers the heap limit. Just to give you a quick idea on how a system call would work, First of all, you have the application. Let's say you want to take uh, some accelerometer data. The first step will be to um, allow a buffer so that the accelerometer capsule can place the result inside the buffer. Afterwards, your application would have to subscribe so that it can get a callback when the buffer is, has been filled. The third item would be to send the command, and the capsule will understand that it needs to perform the action. The capsule will interact with the lower level capsules and with the hardware, but the command system call will return immediately. And afterwards, your application will probably be healed and wait for the callback when the data is available. So um, this, is like, this is a little bit more complicated, but offers you greater flexibility. Uh, OK. Uh, about writing applications, uh, for now, libtoxc is fully supported, and this is the recommended way in writing applications. It's built on top of new libc and libc++. Uh, it has bindings for Lua and little VGL. It still has a problem with the RISC-V architecture, as the compiler is not able to generate the correct code for position independent. If you want to try programming in Rust, you could write applications in Rust. It's still a developmental uh, library. It's in active development. It still has a big bug because there's a big compiler bug um, that prevents us in building uh, position-independent code the right way. So I would strongly suggest you to use C. Uh, our small contribution to the project was to port the D language. That was my student, Teona Severin, which also graduated today. Uh, and she ported the D language and enabled D language for ARM and TOC OS. Uh, of course, without the garbage collection, without the D garbage collection. Uh, you might have seen Joanna this morning in, uh, in the keynote. Her, her work was in porting JavaScript to TOC OS. JavaScript is a really performant JavaScript library. It's used by Fitbit in, this device, in the watch's face. Um, it works on top OS, GPIOs, buttons, LEDs, timers work. We still have some issues with the memory protection because the memory protection unit is not as flexible as the one on your computer. So it imposes some memory alignment limitations and JavaScript is really memory hungry. Uh, when it comes to the executable, we won't have an ELF file. For top OS, we have a TBF file. Uh, it contains a header which specifies how much stack and how much memory the application needs and then the actual application binary. A really cool fact is that TalkOS applications can be shipped with several architecture in the same file, in a tab file, Talk Application Bundle. This is more or less the same way Apple ships uh, applications for the iPhone. You have several iPhone processors, and you have one binary that contains uh, a small binary for each of them. Uh, for loading TalkOS applications, you don't have to rewrite the whole full flash. You can load on the microcontroller flash only the application. Uh, this is done by TalkLoader, which is a small Python script that does this for you. And they even implement in an app store. So you could write TalkLoader, uh, the name of the app. It will download the tab file, select the correct architecture, and ship it to your microcontroller. So this is a really cool feature. And I haven't seen this before in a microcontroller embedded system. Uh, I would like to ask Alex now to um, walk you through what it means to port a new board to TalkOS. Alex, if you can take it from here. 
Yes, hello. So this is the NXP IMXRT uh, 1052 EVKB, the board that we managed to port to Toco S. And it features an ARM Cortex M7 CPU with a nominal frequency of 600 megahertz. This is actually an interesting board for us because uh, it also allows us to work on a side project of ours, which is to run WebAssembly code on top of uh, TocoS in uh, the user space. Also, I would like to use this opportunity to thank um, the NXP office in Romania for supporting uh, this project with boards and also scholarships. Coming back to the board, uh, the NXP uh, EVKB, uh, offers a user-controlled LED, a button, and also a motion sensor. These were, these were used for testing the facilities that we implemented. Other notable facts, it has an Ethernet port and also a 256 megabyte SD RAM. So in our process to port TocoS for this board, we created support for a new architecture, the ARM Cortex-M7, which was mostly based on the existent uh, ARM Cortex-M4, which was already supported by TocoS. Uh, we also managed to implement some of the core features for this board, which are, for example, the serial line uh, for communicating with the board, the I2C peripheral, which was tested by using the motion sensor, and for example, the GPIO, which was tested by using the user LED present on the board. Finally, we also uh, ported the Rust library for the user space for this board. Now let's take a look at what means to implement a feature in TocoS in the, the kernel. So the first part, we have to define the registers, for example, the structure of uh, for the general purpose registers in the right picture. After that, for each register that was defined, we have to define each component. For example, the prescale register in the left photo. After that, we map the structure of registers in the memory and implement the functions that are related to that feature. One of the major problems that we uh, encountered uh, during this process is that the IMXRT has a huge number of registers. For the input-output multiplexer controller, we had 154 registers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in order to deploy uh, an application, we have to use the MCU Expresso IDE and the SDK for this board, which are also normally used in order to program an application for, uh, for this board. Then uh, we import an SDK example uh, like Hello World, and then uh, separately compile the talk image, which will also have to contain the application that will run in the user space, and then drag and drop uh, the application in the IDE, configure the debug to select our image, uh, the talk image instead of the image that would be generated by the SDK example, and then just hit debug in order to program the, the device. We encountered quite a few problems in throughout the development process. Uh, the major problem that we had was uh, an issue with the system timer, which was mostly due to a wrong uh, timer frequency. And we fixed this with a pull request, which is uh, in the process of being accepted, which extends the fu functionality of the SysTick for the ARM Cortex-M uh, processors. Uh, other problems that we encountered, a uh, compiler error in the Rust library, and also a uh, bus error. Uh, we were actually implementing the fix for this, and right before we uh, tried to create a pull request, it was already fixed by the TOC core team and patched in the, in the upstream. Uh, we are now working on porting the full uh, core R core Cortex-M7 uh, features. Uh, we have already uh, implemented all 16 MPU regions, and we are working on uh, supporting full uh, cache uh, features for this board. After that, we will implement the, the other features that were not touched yet, for example, the SPI and the Ethernet. And after that, we will take a look at uh, the other devices from the IMXRT uh, family, such as the 1060. Uh, if there are any, uh, if there is anyone in the audience from uh, from NXP, we would love to collaborate uh, in order to better integrate the, this TocoS development project uh, with the MCU Expresso IDE 
as for the moment, we are kind of doing a hack, like uh, drag and dropping the the talk image inside of the the ID. Uh, also, as Alex mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, TalkOS provides an application called TalkLoader, which uh, helps you to program uh, devices that are supported by uh, boards that are supported by TalkOS. So we are also planning on extending the support for the TalkLoader in order to support the IMXRT board. For the demo, Alex. Yes, I need to get to them here. Yeah. Thank you, Alex, so much. Uh, before we have a demo, uh, I would like to answer one of the questions. So um, the question is if there are any plans for app signing. Uh, yes, there is a TalkOS threat model, which you can find on the TalkOS repository. And this has been already a discussion in adding a digital signature or a way of verifying that apps are, um, are legit, let's say, like that. Uh, I have another question, but that one I will, about the footprint, but I will answer it during the demo. So first of all, uh, let me sh let's dive into this. I will share my screen. Um, so the entire screen. Okay. Um, my screen should be visible. Alex, can you confirm that my screen is visible? Yes. Yes, it's visible. Okay. So just a few seconds. I will show you what I have here. So uh, this is TalkOS. This is the TalkOS repository. As you can see, um, this is just a kernel, not a user space. We have an architecture folder with the processor architectures. Uh, we have a chips folder where we have a specific chip that contains one of the architecture and has the peripherals. And we have a boards folder where we have the entry point of the kernel. Uh, for this example, I will use the Arduino Nano BLE. Uh, it has just been added this week to uh, su as a supported board. And the reset handler of the CPU is basically the main or the entry point into the kernel. We also have a folder with the capsules or the drivers, a documentation folder, and the kernel folder where we can see uh, several where the kernel resides, the scheduler, process loader, and so on and so forth. Uh, for the demo, I will use the Arduino board. So uh, let me just unlock the phone. Uh, if this would work. Okay, so you should be able to see my phone. So I have here an Arduino BLE board. Uh, it's about $30. You can buy it out of Amazon. It's hooked up to an LCD screen, a real nice small LCD screen over SPI, and it's not running anything at the moment. So for the first step that I want to do is to flash the kernel. So. Um, I will enter the boards folder and choose nano, the nano board. And I will say make program and program. Sorry, program. I will put the Arduino into flash mode and I still need to specify the port. This is a problem on the Mac. Somehow it does not detect automatically the port. So um, as you can see, it compiled the kernel. I already had it compiled. Uh, after the compilation, coming back to the footprint, uh, you can see here the size of the kernel. So this is about 90 kilobytes in text. The data is about two kilobytes. Uh, BSS is about 55. So the total memory footprint should be somewhere around um, 90 kilobytes of memory of RAM and 90 kilobytes of, um, I'm sorry, of flash. Uh, the kernel is flashed onto the CPU. On the microcontroller, as you can see, it does nothing. So it's just a kernel. Um, if we were to open a serial, a serial line, um, and this is uh, done with top loader listen, you can see it writes initialization complete, entering main loop, and that's it. OK, so let's write an application. This is the user space for talk. I will leave, use TikTok C. Uh, you can find new lib here, which is pre-compiled, LVGL, the Lua library, the libtalk library, which provides the system calls and the user space for the capsules and the examples. Uh, I will take the Blink example, and this is how a TalkOS program looks like. As you can see, it's more or less like a normal application that you would write for your computer. So there's nothing specific to the microcontroller. It's just a main, and you use the normal function that you would use. So I'm just going to enter examples and blink. I will compile it. I will say make. 
As you can see, it compiled the application. It didn't need any kernel. So this is a normal C compiler. And it built uh, three architectures, the Cortex-M0, Cortex-M3, and Cortex-M4 uh, files. Uh, also, we have a TBF file out of them. So how do we flash an application? We will use Talkloader is not fully supported for Arduino, so we will use BOSAC. BOSAC is the normal Arduino bootloader. Uh, and as you can see, I will flash the um, Cortex M. Um, the file is called Cortex M TBF. So simply, I will simply flash only the TBF file, not the kernel. Again, I'll put the Arduino in the flashing mode. Start flashing. It was super fast. The application was really, really small. And as you can see, it flashes the LEDs. Um, once again, if we go into the listener, we can see um, the device just started, but it's not writing anything on the screen. Now let's try a more difficult application, something with a screen. I have, have here an application that uses LVGL. It just writes loading, displays a gauge, and then says, hello, Talk OS. I will go into LVGL. OK, so this application was about one kilobytes of text, and it used about three kilobytes of memory. Uh, so add this to the kernel, and that is the footprint. Uh, in case of the screen, this will be a little bit larger because it has LVGL, about 60 kilobytes of RAM, and about uh, nine kilobytes, uh, sorry, nine kilobytes of RAM and 60 kilobytes of flash. We have built the application, let's flash it. So I will use again Bolsa and just go and flash the screen. So I will, instead of blink, I will write screen. Sorry, not screen, LVGL. So this is Cortex and TBF. And I would usually do this with talk loader, but it's not supported yet for this. As you can see, flashing takes a little bit longer. And here we go. If we get lucky, uh, yes, LEDs are, uh, oh, sorry. You can see the screen is working. OK, it says loading whenever it's finished. Yeah, the application was normal, normal application. So if I want to flash two applications, I could do that. So what I have to do, I will exit this, and I will simply concatenate concatenate the Blink application and the LVGL application into one single file, which is called apps.tbf. This is done. And now let's flash it. Um, and we'll see an interesting thing here. Uh, oh, forgot to put the Arduino into flash mode. Here we go. You can see it's a little large. And surprise, the LEDs work. Mm, the screen, not so much. Oh, sorry. So the LEDs work, but the screen, not so much. Uh oh, my phone just. Uh... Oh, okay. So, what happened here, we're going to use Talk Loader to uh, listen to see whatever the, Ardu the Arduino is saying. As you can see, uh, due to the memory protection unit alignment, even though it had enough memory, it could not flash both. It could not start both applications. Uh, a trick that you could do is to concatenate them in a different order. So first the screen and then the LEDs. I just changed the concatenation, uh, flash it again, and here we go. This time it should, they should both work. So. It started, as you can see, LEDs are flashing, and the application is running. OK, so um, yeah, switching back to Alex, if you can show us a little bit about the NXP. Yes, just a second to share my screen. Uh, you have to close your share screen first. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Alex. Here you go. Uh, no problem. Okay, you should see my screen right now, right? I see it. Can you confirm, Alex? Okay. Yes, yes, I can so, see it. So, uh, what we have here? Okay, super. So, what we have here is a simple application for uh, the NXP board, which tests the uh, sim a few facilities, a few facilities of the of the board. So, uh, in order to program it, I I hit make. In order to compile the application, this is uh, over the libtalk C uh, library. So this is only the application from the user space. 
After this, we go back to the talk uh, development folder. We make sure that uh, the app variable points to the application uh, that will be uh, used as a user space application. For now, we have to put both the application and the kernel uh, at the same time on the board since the board is not support supported by the talk loader. So I, sim I simply hit make program in order to, to get the, the binary file. After that, in my uh, MCU Expresso IDE, I have a simple uh, SDK example, the hello world. I drag and drop the talk image. Normally, what I would do, I would hit here the uh, enter the configuration mode to see if the application is mine that will be uh, programmed on the device. And now I press debug. Oh, just a second, I forgot to insert the board. <laughs> yes, it should see it. Okay. Okay, so it was copied on the device. Next step, we open a serial connection with a device. Oh, it's the other port. Okay. And then if I hit run, so it's a simple application which allows me to insert my name. And then uh, I can turn on and off an LED. I will turn on the LED in order to, and I will stop sharing the screen so that you can see on my camera. Oh, uh, I don't know if it's full screen. Okay. So the LED that was, okay, just a second. The board More is connected, times. sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, you've seen, okay. And if I go back to share screen, just a second. And back to the serial line. If I want to cause a fault, a hard fault, I simply press X. No, it, the board disconnected. Uh, what happens, uh, I have a, yeah. What happens is that I have a, on, a, on my Mac only USB-C. So the adapter is not fully working. Just a second. Wow. USB-C is not fully, not a standard yet. So, um... yep. That the Apple decided to drop the USB ports. Okay. okay so if you can see a so back here. Uh, okay. If I press X to cause a hard fault, because the program runs in debug mode, uh, first MCU Expresso will take over and say, "Okay, you get a hard fault here." And if I press continue, I will get the output for the hard fault uh, from the from the top OS operating system. So here, if I go up. It says where it uh, it hit kernel panic, and it also says the faulting memory address, which is 0800, because I created a null pointer and assigned uh, a value to it. Also, if we want, we can see uh, other information, such as the, the values of the registers, uh, the way the memory layout looks, and uh, which regions from the MPU were used. I don't know if you want to add anything else to this, Alex. No, uh, I, the thing is like, Alex can send me the binary right now and I could run the same app on my Arduino board and it would work exactly in the same way. Um, here the kernel actually panicked because this is a debug mode, but there's a setting in Toco OS. Alex, Alex, if you could unshare your screen so I can share mine. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a setting in Toco OS, which, okay, starts just, Screen sharing is not working for me. Uh, oh, sorry. It was a problem with the browser. Uh, entire screen. Okay. So getting back to my screen, uh, you can see here, uh, there's a setting setting in uh, top OS uh, about what to do if an application falls. Uh, one is panic. This is for debug development. So you can see the debug. 
and the segmentation fold. Uh, the others are just terminate the app and stop it. And the third one is restart the app. So the system does not uh, completely fail if an app actually fails. Um, yeah, that would be it. Um, I still, I think we still have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I have a question here, uh, which says if capsules are grouped together to make uh, efficient use of interrupt signals from hardware, in other words, is there a limit of a number of capsules we can use related to the number of interrupt signals? Uh, and no, as far as I know, you could use uh, as many capsules uh, you want. Uh, you do have to make some changes. I mean, interrupts are sent not to the capsule but to the lower level um if you look at uh talk os image interrupts are in this orange part so whenever a hardware has an interrupt it goes to this orange part and uh, this orange part sends it to a capsule technically you can have one capsule connected to one mini driver here in the orange part but talk OS supports what we call um virtual uh, drivers where you have a virtual capsule that could, that talks to the lower level capsule and distributes the interrupt to upper layer capsules so yeah technically that's okay uh i have another question what about running talk OS on something like the raspberry pi uh we as the group in the polytechnica are already working on this uh we're trying to port it to cortex a technically it would work it needs we need to add the chip and memory protection would be probably different uh, the first step would be to use simple memory protection with one-to-one -one mapping, and then, yeah, it should work. So probably in a year it should be okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just seeing a static screen now, no demo. I don't know, um, this is something technical. Uh, yeah. Somebody said I would be interested in doing it. Okay, sure, that would be really, really nice. So uh, let's talk, uh, if you can... Talk to us on, uh, on Slack, that would be great. And I think I can reply to you. Uh, you have my email on the website, so just send me an email, that would be great. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'll write you an email. I saw your email now. Okay, how upgrade? How can you upgrade one app from multiple applications like Blink and Display? Uh, upgrading an app. That's a little bit tricky. So for now, apps are located on the flash one after the other. So um, if the upgraded app has the same size as the previous version, that would work. Otherwise, yes, you would have to move the other app further on or uh, closer to this one. Uh, but this is a work in progress. So uh, the Tokyo's design team is thinking on how to better, how to improve this. For now, apps are just located in the flash one after the other. So upgrading one of them is difficult if that one app is not the last one. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. I think I answered most of the questions here. If there are any other questions from the audience, uh, Thomas, I'll write an email to I you. Think that's so. Okay. If there are any other questions, um, I think we should wait see. because, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's another question. Ah, oh, nice work, guys. Thank you. <laughs> As I said, we're not the main developers. We just contributed and played with it. So uh, there's a big TOKOS team working every day on the TOKOS system. So um, we just contributed a little bit to the TOKOS system. OK. Uh, Alex, do you see any other question? Uh, yeah, uh, Thomas also replied, I would love to use uh, with the uh, WASI WebAssembly. Yes, we are uh, currently working as a side project uh, to see uh, if we can run WebAssembly uh, on top of it. Yeah, <laughs> over, over yeah, Rust, nice. uh, that was the first try that we... Um, I think with WASI we had the problem do you want that to continue? the executor... Sorry? Uh, no, no, go on, go on. So with Wasi, I think the problem was that Alex really tried the WebAssembly. Um, the interpreter that we had, the executor, was 
technically non-dependent on the Rust standard library, but due to a bug in cargo, it would still try to link the standard library. So it was impossible for us to uh, build it. I actually have more details on this, but... Uh... Yes, for, for the moment, there is only one module over Rust, which uh, is able to, to interpret WebAssembly code. Uh, that is not dependent on the standard library. Standard library, and uh, this one, as Alex said, has recursive dependencies on standard uh, on the standard library. So what it, so what that means is that uh, it has a module which depends on standard library, and even if we uh, specify that uh, we compile with feature no no STD, it still uh, it still uh, crashes. It's a cargo bug, and uh, even in the latest uh, cargo issue, it does not uh, work. I tried I tried the latest uh, nightly version, and it did not work. Uh, what uh, I'm what about... I think. Uh, okay. Sorry, to, to answer Thomas' question about Node.js uh, and JavaScript, uh, V8, that's a little bit big for what the microcontroller can do. Probably on the Raspberry Pi, it would work. Um, but you can use JavaScript. So we tried JavaScript. It's a really optimized uh, JavaScript machine. It's optimized for size. Fitbit is using it for its watches. I mean, it, it supports um, JavaScript 1.6, I think. Uh, and you can even write TypeScript and transpile it to ES5 and run it. We did this with JavaScript. The only problem is memory, but otherwise it's working pretty well. Did you answer the question about how to upgrade one app from multiple applications like Blink and Display? Yeah. Is that possible? Okay, okay. Yes, applications are one after the other. Uh, upgrading one is okay if that's the last app. If it's an app in the middle, as long as it has the same size, that's fine. Uh, what you could do is basically pad so far the TBF file so that um, you would have space for further updates. But this is a work in progress. We, the Docker team is working on solving this issue. OK. Uh, OK, I don't know if we have any more question here, questions here. Um, Thomas also added, uh, asked when, on which channel we will be on. Uh, I think on Slack, on the IoT channel. So uh, I think you, you can, I'm just entering the IoT channel right now. So um, I think it's two track internet of things. Yeah. 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 Slack IoT channel. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, if there, not, if there aren't any other questions, I really hope we answered everything. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, once again, sorry if it was a little bit confusing or uh, we had made our mistakes. It is 1 a.m. in the morning here. So, and also thank you we so much. Hope, and also we hope, we hope that uh, at least a bit of the demo was able to be seen for the person who did not, uh, did not manage to see it.